Hello guys, uh, thank you for coming here to another interview on Smart City TV. Uh, today I have the pleasure to have here with me uh, Ari Nair. Uh, Ari is a professor of design on the Savannah College of Art and Design and also uh, he is the CEO of Design for Winning, a consulting company that proposes design solutions for many problems. Uh, so Ari, welcome. Uh, your first words as an introduction please. Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm glad to be here. You know, I am, I'm not an expert in smart city, but I, I am an expert in design. You know, so this is the uh, kind of um, insight I'm going to bring to this conversation to start with. Um, but we can talk about it in more detail as soon as we have a very specific direction that we want to address. Uh, personally, you know, I'm interested in everything. You know, as a designer, our curiosity drives our profession to a great extent. And uh, questioning everything around you and looking for insights or problems to solve, that is where I'm coming from. Okay, I'm going great. To stop right there, yeah. Like, great. I think you're going to have a very good conversation, Ari. And I ask, ask the, our viewers to please subscribe to our channels. Uh, and also if they want to receive more information, also uh, indicate that on the, the appropriate place. But Harry, you, you are a design expert, a leading person on the design world. Um, so my, my, my first question is as kind of a provocation for you. It's um, design is normally seen by common people as something that is related to the fashion industry, to the big brand names. Uh, so how design can relate to something so tangible as in a smart city? How things relate? That is a very common misconception that designers are those people who make things look nice. But there is a process behind it which people don't realize. Of course, we do make things look nice. And the brands which you're talking about, whether it's a fashion brand or an automotive brand, that brand image is created by design. You know, working, of course, not in isolation, but along, alongside marketing people, engineers, technic, technologists, salespeople, design kind of helps integrate many different aspects of the business or its story and helps to bring those together. Design thinking is the process behind design. You know, we have a very established process which we use which involves tremendous amount of research up front, secondary research and primary research. We can get into the details later on if necessary. And then we create insights and those insights turn into solutions. And some solutions are aesthetically driven, but most of the time the solutions, the core principle for the insights and the solutions is the consumer focus. We look at what people want, you know, and then meet those needs in some way or other. Working with our partners, we are just one of the cogs in the system, but we drive the, what you call the human element in many cases. And the most successful design applications have been those where the human element was brought forward. You know, the most common example is the Apple computers. Of course, Steve Jobs was not a designer per se, not a trained designer, but he had design thinking in his mind. And of course, he had very good designers working with him, where he was able to not only design the products with a certain sensitivity to the human computer interface, but also from a business sensitivity and from an overall exposure point of view. And there are many examples. I know the more recent example would be Airbnb it was started by a couple of designers from Rhode Island School of Design where I used to teach, I didn't teach them, but they can, they use the design thinking principle to put two and two together. They kind of bring many elements. We are the generalists in a team. We always help to look at things in a broad sense at the same time in a very focused sense, looking at what computer, what people need, and how you can meet those needs. Uh, well, that, that, that's this. very interesting, yeah. uh, Ari, because one of the things that we always say about uh, smart cities is that smart city is a process where we need to put the citizen on the fo as a focus of our, uh, our problems, uh, looking solutions for, 
for the citizens as the focus of the problem. So a uh, citizen-centric solution, as we used to say. So you're saying the design is almost the same thing. So we try to look into the customer, not the citizen, but it's, it's the same person at the end. Uh, to yeah. To the in issues. fact, uh, you know, I want to just brew down it a little bit more. You know, there is a famous diagram, which I will send you later on. It's used by Stanford the Design School, where there are three intersecting circles, a Venn diagram. So the three intersecting circles, one of them is what is viable, the other circle is what is desirable, and the other circle is what is feasible. So the good design you know, lays at the center of the intersection of these three circles. So what is viable is what is good for the market or the people in general, what can be uh, marketed, what, is, what, what kind of services we can provide maybe as a city, and what is desirable is what the consumers want. And most of the time, the, the, uh, the um, designer is, the, is a proponent of the consumer needs in a team, in a multidisciplinary team. And then what is feasible is mostly driven by technologists and engineers who are making sure that this is feasible. And I'm not saying that nobody else is concerned about it, but we drive that specific consumer focus point of view within a design, within a uh, production or project con context, bringing that sensibility in and always keeping that in our mind and reminding our partners around. And at the same time, also visualizing, there's many steps in the process, we didn't get into those steps, but this is visualizing what consumer needs is another aspect of it. And, Okay, so we so, can definitely uh, help in a smart city context. Yeah, yeah, yeah interesting. So, uh, Ari, um, but l let's try to be a little bit more specific towards a smart city. So, uh, one of the big issues we we have, the big problems that almost every citizen or every consumer or uh, or every customer of our city uh, is is the transportation, is mobility. So, uh, and and we have today. That our basic transportation is either the automobiles or the public transportation systems with buses or trains. Um, how, how design can improve the, the issues, the problems that we have in transportation? Could, could you discuss a little bit that from a designing perspective? Absolutely. You know what I would do if I were given that opportunity to look at the city as a whole, as a mechanism or a design opportunity space, I would start with secondary research, which understands what the, how the city is laid out, where the corridors of um, uh, concentration or congestion exist, what are the issues, what are the problems that the current situation faces. That's what we call that secondary research. Without, you can do this from the armchair. I call it armchair research sometimes. You can Google most of it and try to understand the context very well. What are the problems in the city? If you look at Orlando, we know very quickly, we will realize that Orlando is driven by tourist transportation. So just tourist just let me comment that you say in Orlando because you live in the city of Orlando, so. <laughs> yes, yeah, I, you know, I, that's why I'm wearing my beach shirt today. <laughs> so it's actually, it's important to understand the context which you are addressing. And, and I'm not saying that designer is the only one who's doing that. Engineers are doing it from their point of view. Transportation designers are doing it from their point of view. But we can bring in this big picture sensibility to it and help you extract what is relevant for the consumer. That's the next step is a primary research we do. It's almost uh, like a, it is, we call it uh, consumer ethnography. We actually go into people's homes or follow them day in the life, you know, on all kinds of fly on the wall, that kind of many different uh, uh, processes and methods we use to observe what the consumers need. For example, the, the housewife who has to drop the kids off at school first or at the, at the bus stop and still find the way to A to B. And we'll find that maybe her problem is more about getting to point A more than A to B. A to B is a given transport system, but how to get to A. And that is where 
the whole idea of more bikes and other kinds of micro transport systems came into being because we realized there is a link which is important in the transportation cycle. So we can, based on what insights we generate through conversation and interaction with the consumers, we kind of, we use a lot of post-it notes in our process. We bring those insights together and start sketching what we call mini solutions for each of those individual problems. Um, and then we kind of combine the help, combine them together to build the bigger, bigger solution. So it, we start by visualization, by breaking the problem down into small chunks and solving each of those small problems and then combining them together in a systematic way. Of course, working with partners, it is never done in a vacuum. Uh, neither from the consumers nor from the partners. You are always working with other people, but we have the skills to visualize the potential future very quickly. Also, is because that helps a lot. Uh, you know, visualization is prototyping. You know, helps people to visualize what the impact of a situation would be or a solution would be. You, you, you mentioned at the beginning of the interview that uh, one of the points of design is try to find out what the customer wants, what are their needs. But uh, in many cases we have seen in technology that uh, sometimes the customer doesn't know that he wants something. <laughs> uh, and one of, the, one of the good examples and very famous one is the Xerox machine. So when the Xerox process was invented, uh, IBM said, well, we, we don't need that. We don't, need the, we don't have the need for so many copies. And uh, I think that was completely wrong. So th there were a need that nobody knows that was there. And Absolutely, this yeah. process repeating many, many times. So yeah. if design is, is a process to, to find why the customer needs, aren't we missing uh, the things that the customer doesn't know that he, sees, uh, he, he really Absolutely. wants? Absolutely. This is a very important point that you're making. We call it unarticulated needs. When I tell my students to go out and research and my staff, and what I ask them to do is don't waste your time in unmet needs. Because if you ask somebody whether this chair is comfortable or not, they will say yes or no. That is of no use to you one way or the other. But if you observe them sitting in the chair, or how they squirm around or how they reach or how they uh, lean back, you learn a lot about their unarticulated needs, you know, which is through observation most of the time. That is why we use fly on the wall and day in the life and that kind of research techniques, really following. When I was at Whirlpool, I personally have followed people to shopping to their supermarket when they were buying uh, vegetables and things for their refrigerator for their home. So we follow people and understand what they need. And that's where the true gems of insights come from. But there is another place. So the third kind of needs, one is unmet and one is unarticulated. The third kind of need is called emerging needs. Emerging needs is predictive. You know, what is changing in the society? For example, right now we are sitting in the middle of an emerging need, the post-COVID world will have a whole lot of needs from transportation, from resources, from utilities, all kinds of things that are out there. So this is an emerging need, but it's a very fast emerging need. But sometimes emerging needs are very long drawn by trends across some decades you know, of change that is taking place. But designers are always tuned into trends in understand we teach them to under, design for the future and not for now and uh, not only for the 18 months which is normally the cycle of uh, production cycle in the industry but we say think five to ten years ahead and what's going to happen so you, you, you think the design is more uh, evolution or a revolution it, it is both actually you know a revolution in terms of really looking at it from from new points of view, changing the angle of uh, looking at different things, which we call brainstorming or idea generation, ideation, all those things which I talked about. That is one of the good things about breaking a problem down into small chunks, because then you can create new solutions very easily for small problems and not worry about the bigger 
solution. But then when you put them together, you start seeing a certain amount of practicality coming into the uh, into this process. Yeah. So uh, if you have a conversation, suppose you have a conversation with a important mayor in any city in the world, maybe in Latin America, in Asia, or in Africa, uh, what would be your recommendation when he starts talking to you about a smart city? What do you, do you tell him to, three things that he needs to take care of? Yeah, and actually I would start with this viable, desirable, feasible, you know, that is something which is very easy for people to understand, you know, what, hey, we know what is what you can do now, and of course there we'll also factor in the future component to it, we'll build the help, we can help you build a pipeline, uh, you know, or a roadmap for the future, then we will look after the desirable part of it by you know, talking to the people and, you know, interacting with the citizens and finding their needs there. So even there, the citizens have a hierarchy of needs, you know, which is, I kind of compare it to the Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Somewhere in the middle is the home kind of needs, you know, which is connected with your immediate shelter, housing, all those things. And then the second layer would be the neighborhood and then the city, you know, so that uh, what are their needs in all these three layers of the cake? We can't get into the higher levels, but generally, you know, deal with the Maslow's hierarchy. And then you also, you can, I can promise them that hey, we will work with your technologists to determine the feasibility of these things and we won't interfere in their process, but we can fit their process to the consumer needs. So we will act as a, as a go-between and be able to and then help visualize what the result would be if there is a um, user interface or a product or a service. I have shown you some visualizations of transportation ideas, which I'm kind of collecting on my own, you know, creating, hey, what could, how, what is a model for transportation which will transition from micro mobility to mass mobility, you know? So what are the solutions you can create in those phases? And there are design solutions, which just like the Airbnb example, there may be hidden opportunities there we can use to build the solutions along the way. Okay. And, and how, how you will relate uh, the design uh, uh, structural design process that you have in mind that you're talking about with a specific disciplines of our uh, urban planning? I, I, I think we will have, you know, we have discussed this before, the most uh, affinity right now we would have would be with the transportation planners in the city context. Of course, the energy and other things are, um, of course, can also be handled in the, in the short run and in the long run, but the most impact can be created in the mobility area. And that is where um, consumer needs interact, intersect with the, cons with the city infrastructure on a continent. A few years ago, it was digital. You know, maybe there was a, you know, there were many cities where, which are going smart, were putting uh, electronic digital hubs in the city square and things like that. It was all about connectivity. Now it's all about mobility and how the new forms of mobility can help create a smarter, cohesive city environment. So uh, you, you are a world traveler uh, and have been many, many places around the world. So uh, how do you see uh, the differences in, in mobility in the different countries you have been? So you, you see things in, in, in the Asia and in India or, or uh, uh, Pakistan or all those countries in that area, they use rickshaws, uh, sorry, they use the tuk-tuks uh, a lot to transport people. Uh, these are, although efficient from the point of view uh, to take people from point A to point B straight, they are also very inefficient from the energy and uh, the carbon footprint uh, concerns. So how do you see that, that transition into being efficient from the transportation side, but also being efficient from the energy side? 
Very interesting question. I have thought quite a bit about this, especially having been in Asia and India to, to a large extent. I've seen chaos theory in action in many of those mobility situations. You know that uh, if you look at um, Grand Central Station from 3,000 feet, you will think that people are just moving around randomly, but there is an order to it. People are getting from A to B to their trains and catching their trains. It may look like chaos from uh, from high above, but there is a kind of an ultimate order which happens at the ground level. Indian uh, trans uh, road system works more or less like that, where there are motorcycles and auto rickshaws and buses and cars. They all fill the spaces in between and kind of fit in and they maintain the flow to some extent by using chaos theory subconsciously or so and if you build lanes of traffic it'll be the equivalent of a bottleneck for those cities because they just have the just the opposite effect in uh, creating smooth uh, smooth flow of traffic so there is some opportunities in those kinds of and i say that hey what india needs is bumper cars you know not <laughs> you know being able to manage bumper cars kind of get from point A to B one way or the other. So just to answer your question, I have seen you know, great examples of mobility and transportation systems uh, feeding into the culture and the development of, of a city. If I, for example, I you know it may sound disconnected from mobility, but when I was in Hong Kong about 20 years or 25 years ago, the Hong Kong had, you know, new subway stations and infrastructure, and everybody who gets in the in the in the train immediately pull out their mobile phones and start talking to not to each other but to talking to other people. That's because they were able to embed a relay stations within this brand new tunnel. So the best place to make a phone call was the tunnel itself. You know, it's very interesting evolution and of course now it is commonplace everywhere we have ubiquitous uh, access to wireless uh, and our uh, cellular service everywhere it doesn't matter but at that time it was so important it kind of helped the city change transform itself maybe it improves the efficiency of the business people it improved connectivity between families you know it's, it, it must have had a series of what you call domino effect, uh, you know, mm -hmm. in impact in society, which is a great uh, example of technology and rollout, sensible technology being applied at the right time. Yeah, th there is a very famous case in the city of uh, Tirana in Albania. Mm -hmm. It was a very dull city. All the buildings were were grey or brown from from the old uh, times of communist times in, in that area. And Tirana has transformed itself, being today one of the most colorful cities uh, in, in Europe, because the mayor allowed this, the buildings to be painted in any 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 color among a set of different colors. Um, so, although this is not specifically a design issue, uh, the, the question is: uh, do, do you believe that design can change human behavior and, at the end, change uh, the human culture? Absolutely, you know, the public spaces and where people come together to interact. There are great examples in America. I mean, Chicago, the um, uh, um, the uh, the Shell area where, you know, the, there is a new, you know, whole new park development. I don't know if you've been in there, but that's where the big bean is, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I see people are much more relaxed in those environments because they are comfortable and they kind of have, feel safe and it's an interactive space and i see people sitting with their feet in their in little streams along the way and they have, they have kind of created a whole uh, dynamic interactive environment by you know having you know the art as well as design the structures and facilities built in us. It's just an example. That there are many examples like that in other cities. Um, even Orlando, I see, I've been to the new 
smart city development area, it is starting to show signs. Of course, COVID is kind of creating disruption, but people are not out. There is an autonomous vehicle already operating in that in that region. So there's kind of interesting dynamics which can transform. Even Sao Paulo, I noticed that the buildings, uh, there are some neighborhoods where there are colorful buildings coming up, which kind of completely disrupts the, what do you call, run down character, you know, the city neighborhoods breaking down. So it kind of helps you to rejuvenate the neighborhoods by creating some amount of excitement through art or public, um, public buildings or facilities which enable the citizen participation, you know. Okay, we are almost uh, running up uh, our time, but uh, we still have s s a few minutes. But I, I want to pose another another question for you. Okay, do sure. You, do you consider do you consider design more of uh, an art or a science? It's interesting. Design is somewhere in between. <laughs> you know, if you really look at it, we do have the characteristics of the artist in us, but we are not too driven by technology or by process that we become boring and uh, you know when I teach my students I tell them there is a black box method of designing thing, things which is the artist who soaks in a problem or a context overnight and gets this eureka moment in the morning it's a, he, he or she cannot explain how they arrived at the solution it, but it's great art you know it just blows people away and at the other end is the glass box method where every step of the process is known and you can easily explain how you arrived at something, the mathematician's approach, which is a scientific step by step. We are somewhere in between. We use a little bit of the art to for generate these small ideas, which I was talking about brainstorming is a big part of it. And then we also use the process to explain to other people how so the secondary research, the primary research, insight generation. So you can always defend, you know, my students are equipped to defend their design by saying that, hey, this is the insight which led to this particular solution. Just like Apple will say that more people are fed up with more than uh, seven levels of interaction. So they kind of build it in and this came from that interact insight, which is collected through scientific research, but that is an insight. Okay, and you yourself, so if you said that design is just in the middle, but you position yourself more as a scientist or an artist? <laughs> no, I think of myself as an artist. I, I do paint and I do, you know, engage in non, what do you call, uh, non-purposeful activities. <laughs> you can call it frivolous, but, you know, it helps me to keep my, my psyche sharp and uh, yeah. my creativity going yeah it's very important Absolutely. for people that i always tell my students you need to have a side gig you know of some kind you know i always work i have something going on on the side which i work on which is different from your know, work work which keeps me engaged in uh, other activities okay Ari, thank you very much for your time we are finishing uh, our time uh, I also want to thank you, all the viewers that have uh, followed us here. Um, please subscribe to the channel. And uh, Ari, you have uh, uh, the last few words uh, before we, we finish. Thank you very much, Lorenzo. And I know that you are, you've been an authority in the smart cities. You know, this is amazing that you have the kind of big picture view which you can bring in either through this channel or through other forms which I have seen you engage in multiple uh, multidisciplinary context. So it's a blessing that you are there. People like you are engaged in smart cities because many times people get forget um, in the spirit of specialization what it's all about. So I will be glad to help at any point of time. Thank you. Okay. Again, thank, thank you, you very much. Uh, thank you very much. And thank you the viewers uh, for following us here. See you next interview.